Hi, good morning, everyone. If I could ask you to please take your seats. We are getting a little bit of a late start. Thank you so much for braving gate traffic to be here this morning. Uh, my name is Michelle Paranzino. I teach in the Strategy and Policy Department here at the Naval War College. Welcome to day two of the Women, Peace, and Security Symposium. Our first session is uh, Advancing Women's Meaningful Participation in Peace and Security. Uh, please welcome our panelists and our moderator, Ambassador Eric Nelson. He is the Associate Director of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany. As U.S. Ambassador in Residence, he contributes a whole of government perspective to the Marshall Center's mission to educate, engage, and empower security partners and leaders to collectively affect regional, transnational, and global challenges. Thank you so much for being here, Ambassador Nelson. The floor is yours. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, all. Uh, how many do we have also online today so far? Uh, we have 16 participants 16, online. Good. Well, we're a small group. Maybe we have more people in this uh, Newport traffic jam that I certainly didn't expect. But um, I want to begin by thanking our hosts uh, at the U.S. Naval War College for the invitation and to Saida and her team for putting together a wonderful program. For us at the Marshall Center, it's a wonderful opportunity to engage with this community of experts and, and advocates to think about how we need to advance women, peace, and security, especially by mainstreaming it within what we teach. And it's a pleasure to be here at the War College to see, Naval War College, to see how you are leading that effort. I also want to thank all of the students and, uh, and thank the Commandant for inviting all of the students at the War College to join in this symposium. We hope and we feel some pressure here on the panel to make this um, stimulating and interesting. And we hope that it's going to uh, stimulate your discussions in, in your courses and in your seminars to always be uh, thinking about the gender angle, the gender factors, that this is not a um, WPS is not uh, nice to have, but it's uh, too often a critical point of failure. Um, at the Marshall Center, we are approaching uh, WPS is a critical part and the fundamental part of human security. Um, all of us who are working to deliver security to our communities and our, and our nations uh, need to recognize, and most of us do, that security must involve all communities, um, no matter the person's identity. And if we're not including all communities, we're not able to provide real security. Um, I am uh, have the great opportunity to moderate a panel of real experts in 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 women, peace, and security, and I encourage you to read their papers if you haven't already. And we're going to get an excellent summary from each of them, about eight minutes long. They've all rehearsed, and um, but I just wanted to begin with a few um, overarching points that that I found uh, especially. Uh, interesting from their from their um, their uh, analysis, um, and one is that um, this is WPS is a good example of norm setting. That when you look at the development of human rights, uh, it wasn't until 1948 that the community of nations came together in New York at the United Nations to develop a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And that was driven by the horrors of World War II. And it's quite a statement of what human rights consist of. It's uh, uh, quite an expansion of the US Bill of, Bill of Rights, uh, I would say. It was led by Eleanor Roosevelt, the, the widow of the, the late president. And it has several articles, but most importantly, is article, most important is Article Three, which states that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. And Article Two had said that everyone is entitled to rights and freedoms, regardless of sex or any other status. So that was a, a critical setting of norms in 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 our history. Um, Fifty-two years later. The UN Security Council resolution wanted to set 
new norms and make clear what the norms would be for women, peace and security. Because if security is guaranteed to all, there the lessons of the 90s and, and uh, genocide in the 90s and continuing wars across the globe were demonstrating that the women especially were vulnerable. And that produced uh, UN Security Council Re Resolution 1325 and several since, which is, have reformed, re re reinforced how we need to make very clear among ourselves that this is a norm we all want to reach. And Daniela um, talks about the the steps of diffusion of norms that um, you go through. One is the emergence of the norm, which is the beginning when you have entrepreneurs and advocates saying, this is a principle that we should all be following. Then you have move into a, a stage of cascade of those norms where the norm is adopted and accepted by states and other organizations. And then you move into implementation, where, which is where um, those norms are promulgated through national action plans and agendas. And each of our um, panels today, we talk about, it. well, how are we doing on the implementation? What is, what does meaningful participation of women in security look like? And here, uh, yesterday we heard that it was 11 years after the UN Security Resolution that the US finally developed its national action plan. So it took 11 years for 15 countries to move to the implementation stage. And there are still allies who do not have national action plans. So this is very much a work in progress. It's very much very uh, 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 a continuing project where I don't think any of us are satisfied with the project achieved. And we're gonna hear a lot about that from, from this panel. So let's begin with um, Colonel Dana Perkins of the U.S. Army War College. Dana has um, studied women in disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Nelson. I will discuss um, how two seemingly distinct frameworks for action, the women disarmament, non-proliferation, and arms control uh, spearheaded by the UN General Assembly and the WPS agenda of the UN Security Council started to converge and build on each other and why it is important for the WPS practitioners uh, to make uh, stronger linkages between the two frameworks. In the short time I have, uh, I will only illustrate this point with examples from the biological weapons non-proliferation regime, since uh, in my opinion, this is a watershed moment in history in favor of international efforts to ensure global health security and in general, the inclusion of more voices in governance, uh, peace and security. A standard disclaimer here that my opinions are my own. And I assure you that I have lots of opinions on this topic. <laughs> um, historically, uh, crisis and disasters increase the risk of gender-based violence and sex trafficking. This is also true for um, uh, public health emergencies. A pandemic or any epidemic due to natural, accidental, or deliberate causes is bound to affect women more than most as they represent over 70% of the global workforce in health and social sectors, and almost 80% of si single parents. A biological weapon would have a disproportionate ad ad adverse impact on women, uh, which should be a call to action to increase the participation and decision-making agency of women in the weapons of mass destruction treaty negotiations and national implementation. Not giving women a voice at the table where their fates are decided uh, means that a vital perspective uh, is being lost. While there are still gaps in implementing WPS, uh, there was also significant progress, both at the national and international level, whether on national action plans, foreign policies, legislation, the, the establishment of the WPS Humanitarian Assistance Compact and the WPS Focal Points Network. There are also annual WPS reports of the UN Secretary General. 
of note, the last year report uh, notes that less than half of the national action plans on WPS include specific actions on disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control. And I quote here, despite its importance for the realization of the women, peace and security agenda. Uh, personally, I found this surprising, uh, considering that uh, the eight resolutions from 2010 on, uh, on women disarmament, non-proliferation and arms control, promote shared tenets and similar principles as those in the WPS agenda and come from the collective 193 UN member states in the General Assembly compared to the 15 uh, in the UN Security Council. Starting in 2013 and biannually from 2014, the UN Secretary General also publishes reports on the implementation of these resolutions, but voluntary contributions from member states uh, are sparse, usually about five to eight states um, report, and uh, also um, there are reports from international organizations. NATO also uh, reported once in 2016. Um, notably, the, the contributors are always emphasizing their WPS efforts, and uh, this is, in my opinion, a tremendous opportunity uh, to highlight the linkages and synergy between the two frameworks. The cornerstones of the global biological weapons non-proliferation regimes are the Biological Weapons Convention and the UN Security Council Resolution 1540 on WMD non-proliferation. The BWC has 185 states parties and uh, uh, ban an entire category of weapons of mass destruction. States parties reach additional agreements and understanding at the review conferences, which usually take place uh, every five years. At the last review conference in uh, uh, December last year, 36% of states parties delegates are women, both civilian and military, uh, combined and coming from uh, diverse sectors, not only foreign affairs. And only 31% of participatory states parties at this review conference had a woman as the head of the delegation. This is consistent with trends from other BWC meetings, as well as trends in other WMD treaty negotiations. Uh, notably, the, this last review conference was the first review conference uh, uh, of the Biological Weapons Convention where gender issues were given more attention in particular with regard to women's empowerment in support of strengthening the convention. However, in the end, there was no consensus among states parties on inclusion of such language in the, in the final document uh, of the conference. Sorry, Resolution 1540 adopted uh, uh, under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter in 2004 affirms that proliferation of nuclear, chemical and biological weapons and their means of delivery constitutes a threat to international peace and security. Um, state, uh, all UN member states have obligations under these uh, resolutions to deny uh, 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 and not support uh, non-state actors from developing, acquiring, using nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons. The implementation of Resolution 1540 is monitored by the 1540 Committee, which is comprised of diplomats representing the current composition of the UN Security Council. The 1540 Committee is assisted by a group of experts nominated by states and selected by the UN Secretary General to, to assist the committee in carrying out its mandate, including the facilitation of assistance to improve the implementation of the resolution. These 1540 experts are the public face of international engagement, outreach, and assistant, assistance. However, only 25% of the total number of current and former experts, and uh, I count myself among them, are women, and only men served as uh, coordinators of the group of experts. So... Uh, how can we promote women's meaningful participation in negotiation and implementation of Biological Weapons Convention, Resolution 1540, and in general in policy development uh, regarding WMDs? 
Uh, I believe we need uh, the proverbial global village, both top-down and bottom-up national approaches uh, to promote women's participation in general in countering weapons of mass destruction as national and international technical experts, both civilian and military, as diplomats, delegates, decision ma makers, and advocates. Similar to what is described in STEM fields, external factors like a lack of role models, cultures that tend to exclude women and persistent stereotypes about women's intellectual abilities reinforce a wide uh, gender gap in meaningful participation. We should provide education and training to address the lack of awareness about global norms against biologic weapons, promote the shared tenets of WPS agenda and women in disarmament and non-proliferation arms control resolutions in the PME curriculum, and also utilize and contribute content to the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs Disarmament Education Portal. Uh, also, a, a, a statistic I would like to share here, uh, at the only Army course that provides an additional skill identifier as counter WMD advisor, there are only 8% women between 2020 and 2023. Uh, I have just been uh, accepted in the Air Force Institute of Technology counter WMD uh, program, so I will see what's the percentage uh, uh, in the Air Force regarding uh, uh, women in counter WMD fields. This is my last slide to conclude. Uh, the threat environment is consi consistently changing, but WMD threats and violent extremism, including the threat of uh, terrorists using uh, uh, WMD and related materials, they are all persistent threats and we need to look for new synergies and approaches uh, to address them. The two frameworks I discuss here, WPS and Women Disarmament, Non-Proliferation and Arms Control, are capabilities that we need to fully develop to take advantage of uh, the largest untapped reservoir of talent in the world, as Secretary Clinton once said, uh, in our fight against uh, weapons of mass destruction, proliferation and violent extremism. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dana. You, you remind me of one of my favorite quotes I heard yesterday. Um, you don't need women. Uh, you may not need women to win battles, but you need women to win wars and sustain peace. I mean, to add to that, you need women to have effective arms control of d WMD and, and um, weapons of mass destruction. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to invite to our conversation Dr. Jennifer Santiago Oreta. She's a professor at the uh, Ateno de Ma Ma Manila University, and she's written about expanding space for women in the security sector uh, using the Philippines as a case study. Jennifer. Thank you, Ambassador. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Santiago Oreta. Um, my task my task today is to look at how we are progressing in the Philippines with regard to WPS and gender mainstreaming. The, sorry, the Philippines is an archipelago of 7,107 islands, plus an additional 500 islands if we include the ones that we are claiming in the South China Sea. You know, we know we also call it the West Philippine Sea or WPS. Uh, it's an it's an attempt at uh, renaming the part of the sea that's near us in order to strengthen our claim. We have 81 provinces, 76 of which have presence of armed rebel groups. We refer to these areas as conflict-affected areas. There are several armed groups proliferating in the Philippines, the communist insurgents, the separatists, terrorists, criminal syndicates, drug networks, private armies, you name it, we actually have it. These armed groups trace back its roots from the late 1800s, the anti-colonizer movement, the, which is the anti-Spanish, later on the anti-American, later on anti-Japanese during the Second World War. Uh, and these groups have eventually morphed in their present permutation of communist, um, secessionist, uh, and terrorist. So our history of armed conflict is actually long. The map here shows you the areas where armed hostilities are actually present and felt. The darker the shade, the higher is the intensity of armed engagement between government troops and armed groups. These are also the areas where the number of internally displaced persons or IDPs are high, most of which are women, children, and the elderly. 
the women's movement in the country likewise has a long history. We are one of the first in Asia to legalize women's suffrage in 1937. The struggle for gender equality is reflected in the many legislations that we have, we have passed. Our version of DEI or diversity, equality, inclusion are the laws on gender and development, the Magna Carta of Women, and the anti-violence against women and children. We refer to this collectively as gender mainstreaming. These laws are institutionalized and operationalized in the government system. As you see in the diagram, we have a presidential unitary system shown in the dark green boxes. The gray boxes with the red font on the side are the institutionalized mechanisms created by the laws to ensure that diversity, equality, inclusion are actually guaranteed. When the UN Resolution 1325 and 1820 were adopted, the Philippines was the first in Asia to adopt a national action plan uh, in 2010. Given our long history of armed conflict and the long history of women's movement, the conceptual and cognitive acceptance of the WPS found no resistance. In fact, it was welcomed. The challenge is the operationalization and the synchronization of WPS and gender mainstreaming. This study actually looks at how the core security sector, the police and the military in particular, manages the gender mainstreaming and WPS. The Armed Forces of the Philippines, or the AFP, opened its doors to women combat soldiers and officers in 1993. Prior to 1993, women in the military basically are an auxiliary corps. The police has long been accepting female members, but to date only 18% of their population are women. There is a quota of 10% for, uh, for the police per year and 20% in the military, although this is not fully fulfilled. Several mechanisms have been created to satisfy gender mainstreaming or DEI, but it was only after the WPS adoption was uh, where a more nuanced approach were established both in the police and the military. Notable of these efforts are the hijab troopers. Do you see there in the slide? This, is a, this was created in 2017 at the height of the uh, siege in Marawi City by groups identified with IS. The hijab troopers is an all-female uh, military and police. Not all of them are Muslims. All are wearing hijab. Their main task is to deal with, consult, engage with internally displaced people who are dominantly Muslim. While critics, um, uh, while the hijab troopers was met with criticisms by some civil society groups for appropriating allegedly the identity symbols of Muslims, the unit arguably was able to effectively engage with IDPs and soften the hyper-masculine hard security approach of the military. Another exemplary effort is the development of the GPS protocol or the gender peace and security protocols in checkpoints, especially in conflict-affected areas. These are some of the noteworthy examples, but uh, given the limited time, I will reserve some other examples during the Q&A. Now, as I've mentioned, acceptance of the gender mainstreaming and the WPS in our security sector was not an issue. It is more the operationalization. Listed on the screen are recommended interventions. You will notice that the recommendations are focused on uh, standardization, no? that's the merit and promotion. Institutionalization, that is the safe space for grievance and mainstreaming of uh, WPS and other security agencies. And on assessing and measuring impact. So this is the protocol development and the uh, uh, M&E or the mo uh, monitoring and evaluation metrics. If we simply base our WPS and DEI assessment on institution me institutions and mechanisms, and rules of engagement, we are definitely uh, moving forward. However, there are complicating factors. Given that towers is a non-international armed conflict or NIAC, and the military, not the police, you know, the military is given the task of handling internal security, it actually creates a large gray zone, in, especially in conflict areas. Gray zones are ambiguous and complex situations where groups navigate a continuum of legal and illegal policy environment. And uh, uh, for example, the peace agreement between the government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front or the MILF created mechanisms that 
have no legal basis, but because it was part of a political agreement, it can't also be labeled as illegal. For example, the Joint Peace and Security Team, or JPST, is a mechanism created based on the political agreement. So combatants from the MILF join forces with the police and the military in patrolling communities to ensure the safety of civilians. These combatants are allowed to carry weapons together with the military and the police. JPST has no legal mandate, but it's allowed to operate because, as I've said, of the peace agreement. So in these gray zone areas, human rights in IHL has a tug of war. The dominant legal regime to operate in these areas is ambiguous. Because of its ambiguity, activities in these areas are subject to very little regulation, if any. WPS and gender mainstreaming is non-existent in these areas. And now with China occupying and militarizing the South China Sea, WPS is again being set aside, given the preponderance of state-centric territorial sovereignty discussion in the security circles. So thus, while it may appear as we are moving forward, the complex security threat, uh, complex security and threat environment we face serve as the major stumbling block in our WPS and gender mainstreaming work. I end my presentation here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I found it especially interesting in, in your, um, your, your discourse when you talked about the integrity of, of the security institutions, how they had lost in respect and support during the period of martial law and their embrace and of human rights and of, of equality has been important for them regaining that in public support. And you added that because of that, they actually were now getting better budgets. Is that right? Well, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Daniela Sepulveda. She is a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Minnesota who's talked about feminist foreign policies in Latin America. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to thank the U.S. Naval War College for hosting this activity and giving me the opportunity to share the Latin American case with you all. Um, in this presentation, I am not going to talk about implementation of the WPS in the field because I have the sense that you have received a lot of information and experiences of different cases and countries. So addressing the Latin American case, I am going to refer directly to the main message I want to leave today. Um, I want to show new research agendas that emerge when we study the WPS linked with the feminist foreign policies in Latin America. But more importantly, I would like to show how the shortcomings of the WPS implementation efforts can actually be an amazing opportunity for the foreign policy building and decision process in the global south. Um, I have to say this is not something that I work only from an academic point of view. I'm complementing this knowledge with a, my previous experience when I worked in the Ministry of Defense of Chile for, well, almost 10 years. Um, and one of my tasks down there was the implementation and evaluation of the WPS as a tool for bilateral and multilateral cooperation among Latin American countries. So I will address two main issues in this presentation. The first one is the disaffection created, created by the WPS agenda and the tensions between the global north and the global south. And the second point is going to be this intersection between the WPS and the feminist foreign policy project. So there, I'm going to start with the disaffection issue. This is Latin America. On the map, you can see all the countries in Latin America that have a national action plan for the implementation of the WPS. We have Argentina, Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. Colombia is in the picture only because it's a special case. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, <clears throat> many of these countries are active troop contributors uh, in peacekeeping operations, as you may know. But the curious thing about the Latin American case is that in traditional terms, uh, the WPS is formally applied in only one country, and this country is Colombia. Uh, Colombia is a country that has been under, you know, this under nearly 60 years of internal conflict. However, they do not have a national action plan for the WPS. Despite this, 
this topic, I mean, the, the participation of women in peace initiatives has been crucial for the peace, the Colombian peace agreement since the year 2016. And on the other hand, we have, we have countries like um, Mexico, Brazil, or Guatemala that, that do have a national action plan, but internally they have the highest rights of violence and discrimination against women. And we also have countries like Chile and Uruguay that they are like the good students in the neighborhood. Um, in the case of Chile, for example, this country has published two national action plans for the WPS, the first one in 2009, the second one in 2015, and they are currently working in the design of a third plan to be published, I think, later this fall. Um, however, despite the good prestige of Chile or Uruguay, I have to recognize that their plans are mainly testimonials. They are like letters of good intentions and a way to assimilate their interest with the interests of other countries from the global, of the global north. The problem with these different approaches is that actually they tell us a lot about the tensions between the global north and the global south. In the last 23 years since the publication of the 1325 resolution, we have seen that the WPS has universalized and standardized objectives to be applied in contexts that may differ a lot from each other. The problem is that establishing peace, maintaining peace, building peace, observing peace, and even negotiating peace have different purposes and processes. Yet, the uniformity continues to be a distinctive element of the WPS agenda, the UN resolutions, and the UN's presence in peace missions, whatever their format is. This uniformity is something that has been pushed by the Global North. And as a result, we have seen some um, disaffection and resistance in the implementation efforts in Latin America, because this agenda sometimes it seems to represent it seems to represent the will of the global north that looks at the global south as an implementation laboratory, but not as a region where the WPS is also written according to the necessities and priorities of the global south countries. Now I want to move to the second and final part of my presentation and. I'm going to talk about the intersection between the WPS and the Feminist Foreign Policy Project, which is something I'm working from my foundation, a New Foreign Policy, Fundación Nueva Política Exterior, based in Chile. In some countries, the WPS is a matter of identity, of their defense and foreign policies, which defines the strategies of international participation and engagement of these countries. And for this reason, the integration of the analysis of feminist foreign policies is crucial to understand the new phase of the implementation um, of the WPS agenda. Since the year 2000. 14, more than 20 countries have formally or informally declared that their foreign policies would integrate an active gender perspective on issues from international security to economic cooperation. Also, most of these countries are from the global north. In recent years, Mexico, Colombia, and Chile have joined this trend, and more Latin American countries are expected to do so. Just, I'm thinking in the case, for example, of Argentina, or maybe a Brazil now under the presidency of Lula da Silva. Um, the question is, why small and medium countries pursue feminist foreign policies? In general terms, I argue that they do this uh, to obtain international status, uh, establish recognition as progressive, and distinguish themselves regionally. And in some way, the adoption of feminist foreign policy is a commitment with liberal values that the Global South identifies as a key piece of the international hierarchy and therefore helps to secure recognition and legitimacy from the Global North countries. This has important implications for the WPS because it can be a risk or an opportunity. A risk, it can be a risk because these countries uh, may reproduce, again, a passive assimilation of external interests, or it can be an opportunity for Latin American countries to write the WPS under their own terms and priorities. In conclusion, I would say that 
it is not a coincidence that all the global North countries with a feminist, for, feminist foreign policy are NATO members. In my view, this is an opportunity. The proliferation of feminist foreign policies in Latin America is an ally of the WPS agenda. And the US has an important role here. Um, in its core ideas, I would say that the feminist foreign policy is strengthens Western democratic values. And in a world where the hegemony of the US is being challenged every single day, understanding and protecting the priorities of the global South is crucial. If the global South considers that the WPS or the feminist foreign policy are emblematic of their shared values, it is in the national US, it's in the US national interest to engage with these ideas. By doing so, the U.S. will not only promote democratic values at a very low cost, but we also build relationships based on cooperation and not resistance. And that's all for, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. You raised some really um, important and challenging issues of you know, are these Western values, are these universal values, is this North versus South? Um, and is the legitimacy and recognition that these norms bring, you mentioned that brings, that's legitimacy from the international community. I'm very, I'm always very curious how much of this is then legitimacy among citizens. And then all of us should be thinking about how does this then come into play in um, strategic competition. But thank you very much, Daniela. Our fourth speaker is um, Dr. James Minich. Uh, he is the Ch WPS chair and a professor at the uh, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, our sister institution in, in Honolulu. Um, James uh, takes us into an important area, looking at the politics of belonging, discussing men as allies and the meaningful inclusion of women in the security sector. James, please. Thank you. And it is a distinct honor to be here. Uh, grateful to be on the panel with uh, um, my esteemed colleagues. Recognize the great contributions uh, and of this event, and recognize my close friend Dr. Syra Yamin, who has uh, put all this together. And so, uh, you're to be commended. Thank you for that. This year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the 1948. Women's Armed Services Integration uh, Act, 75 years. This was segregated service, of course, as women served uh, in separate organizations. Um, the Women's uh, Army Corps, for example. And women, while they served, their numbers couldn't exceed 2% of the force. We also celebrate this year the 45th anniversary of the 1978 Congressional Amendment of that Women's Armed Services Integration Act, in which women could then serve within the organizations, the same organizations of men. That may seem like a little bit ago, but it's contemporary for me. Uh, and I've watched as this has transitioned uh, over time. There's been other policies, of course, maybe the, the most the latest one, 2015, the uh, repeal of the combat arms exclusion. And so while the unbarring the door through legislation and policy measures is important, it's not enough. The, we often use the terms integration and inclusion as if though they're interchangeable, that they mean the same thing. They do not. In integration, we expect women to adapt to the system, but in inclusion, we, ex we ensure that the system adapts to women. In, gen in a gender integrated approach, we permit women to serve alongside men in these masculinized units with some accommodations and less acceptance. Such organizations are certainly male dominant. They're deep-seated masculinized cultures. They forge obstacles to women's uh, full participation and they do experience high levels of sexual violence. Now, a gender inclusive approach is different. It merges men and women together with full access to the system. 
In such organizations, the default gender is not male. The barriers for women have been eliminated. All are valued, and the structure and its leaders do not allow the strong to prey upon the weak. Real briefly, a little bit on culture, social costs, and belonging. So in 2017, Sandra Perone published this book. It's, uh, it's, it's her memoir of a Canadian, of Canada's first female infantry officer. It's an interesting read, but it depicts harrowing accounts of institutional sexism that sanctioned repeated violence against her by her leaders and her and her peers, and it includes instances of her rape, her beatings, and a litany of indignities that were meant to send the message that she did not belong. Her story is not unique. It's not unique to Canada. And it's not unique to a time in history. It's contemporary. Just consider last year in Canada, the former Canadian Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbor submitted her commissioned report on sexual misconduct and leadership of the Canadian Armed Forces. And in her opening statement, she says that the CAF has an archaic and deeply damaging organizational culture. Isn't that a place you want to be? Let's talk just a minute about organizational culture. You know, it is a diet of cultural model and settings. Models being the tone of the organization and settings being those reoccurring uh, group interactions that does what the organization values or not. Think about social costs. Men can rise above a label of self-serving accusations that women are, are fronted with when they... Uh, when they, when they confront this, this can then make their allyship more effective when they choose to act, when men choose to act. And while 85% of surveyed men say, yes, they'd be motivated to act as allies, we find that there are real social costs for men to do so. They risk losing being in the in-group status. Their masculinity is questioned. And so for men to really be able to act, we need to have organizations that have a culture of belonging. And so what do we mean? Well, first, this positive correlation that I'm talking about. So between men and their willingness to support as allies and this organizational culture of belonging. When, it, when organizations are like that, 96% of men seem to stand, come forward and be these allies. But when there is not a culture of belonging, that drops precipitously down to about 30% of men for the very social cost that I was just speaking about. So what is belonging? Well, we're talking about emotion that is born in security and support from a sense of social acceptance, that we have acceptance in, in these units we're in. But truly inclusive teams are a place of belonging, right? I mean, there it's an environment where barriers are torn down, where all feel valued, where divergent opinions are respected and people don't have to conform to be accepted. And you think whether or not that fits an organization you've been in. Do you feel like you had to conform to be there? Do they really value your, uh, your, out, your uh, divergent opinion or do we just really want people to agree and salute and move forward? Allies then must be no do, right? So what are the be no do's of allyship? Well, to be is about character. We're talking about that which is shaped by values and attributes. To know is about competency. We're talking about that which is exhibited by critical and ethical reasoning, problem solving, decision making. And to do is to achieve. And allies need to, to do. So to be, men must step up. And they must be allies by acting against sexism. That's reactive allyship. But they must also promote this meaningful belonging we're talking about. And that is proactive allyship. And so men this must, to really must be visible allies that, um, that, that, that do both of these. Active, uh, reactive allyship and proactive allyship. Proactive, we're talking about then um 
that they need to use their influence to advocate, their voice to amplify, their time to support. This is what men generally carry, influence, voice, and time. And to be proactive, they need to use it. But they also have to have that courage to stand up against sexism, sexual harassment, and assault. And it is those things are, are, are very uh, troubling. So when we know, we ought to consider what it is we know then about um, being an ally on what we don't know. We talk often about our biases. We need to understand them. But but sexism has, you know, a dual component. There is hostile sexism and there is benevolent sexism, but they are both very um, uh, deeply damaging. When we think about this, where you, there's paternalism. Uh, that has, you know, we're talking about interfering with autonomy. And we're then on, on the hostile side, we're talking about how it is dominative, how we dominate women by women are incompetent to serve in these, you know, in areas of economics and areas of policy and all these areas. And we denigrate their service if they try to. Or on the other extreme and benevolent is protective and how we create spaces where they need to be domesticated and in the home. And that's where they need to be. We look at gender differentiation and, and, and whether it's competitive, only men are strong enough to do this, or whether or not it's complementary. And of course, women are men's uh, better half, right? They complete men. It's all about men. Or the heterosexuality of it and how it is hostile uh, and as it's exhibited in sexual harassment or sexual assault, or the intimacy level where there is this contract where men provide protection and love as long as women are subordinated to men. This is a dichotomy on how we how how sexism is is manifested. Real quickly, then let me finish. Men and when we think about teams, men and women are different. But then again, all people are different. And so we devalue women either through sex or through gender. Um, we could talk more about that, but leaders are responsible for the safety and welfare of their people. Many of you are familiar with the uh, Fort Hood uh, Independent uh, Review Committee's uh, findings when just recently they did determine that the command climate down in Fort Hood was ineffective and it was permissive environment for sexual harassment and sexual assault. Sex sexual harassment and assault, it is an insider threat. We talk about insider threats. Uh, this is a real insider threat. I mean, it destroys lives. It corrodes trusts. It decays readiness. When we think about concern for others, too often we quote, but less frequently adhere to Teddy Roosevelt's admonition about care. And that is that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. We must show our care. Um, and the, let me let me end here real quickly because time is short. Talking about the do of work, working of uh, allyship, and we must do now. We can't wait until the system has evolved to a point where women are are prevalent everywhere. Because this is not a time issue. Women are just not going to get there with more time. This is going to take active uh, work. We must create this culture of belonging. And so if building teams is hard, creating a culture of belonging is harder, but we must get after it. We must promote women leaders. Men occupy most of the positions. The only way women are going to go forward is if men will promote them into these, these areas. We must systematize the diversity and in, in inclusion. It is a deliberate process. And it requires implementations of policies, practices, and procedures. And we must review those that are currently existing and see whether or not uh, they actually support this. And we must institute professional scaffolding that will guide, model, counsel, coach, and mentor our people to be inclusive and to have this type of environment. And so I'll, I'll yield the time there. Thank you, James. I I find your your call to action um, really inspiring, and your the way you describe belonging um, is an inclusive uh, description of what diversity, equity, inclusion is about. 
Um, this is not a nice to have. This is, this is essential. Um, this is not a zero sum game where, um, um, one, one group advances at the expense of another. The reality is, and you, and you talk about this in your, in your research that the U.S. military is falling well short of recruiting targets, uh, 25% last year. And, um, retention is a challenge as well. So if you cannot even fill the billets you have, and you cannot grow your people, um, you cannot deliver security. And that requires a whole effort, and that inquires, requires inclusion of women. And it will not, representation is important, but this is not a mandate for women to bear more responsibility to advance women. Without allies, you extrapolate, it would take 165 years at the current rate of progress for us to reach equity. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Thank you. Do you want to add? No, I'm, uh, yes. We have heard throughout this conference that this is just a problem of time. We just, we will get there if we just give it more time. And I started off saying, we, okay, we've been at it for 75 years. I've been at it for 45 years. We will get there when we change the culture and we stop expecting this is a boys club. You can join it. No, this is a this is this is a security sector that women have every right to be in. They've been excluded. We need to restructure the entire sector so that it is an inclusive one. You're so spot on. And when we do that, then we won't have retention issues. People will want to belong to the organization. We won't be hemorrhaging.